Greetings, everyone. From Sports Zone Chicago, Chicago's number one sports talk radio app, it is Jamar Harp from uh, Introducing Sports 101, the sports show that brings knowledge to the game. Today, we'll be talking about horse racing, in particular, the African American presence in horse racing. Before we do that, I would just like to contextualize things that's been going around uh, the sport, and particularly the Kentucky Derby. Um, last Saturday, the Kentucky Derby uh, was ran um, after a four month delay due to COVID-19. Um, even though it was ran, it was uh, the subject of a lot of uh, protest and anguish. Um, this was due to the uh, killing of Breonna Taylor or murder, excuse me, on March 13th. If you don't know about Breonna Taylor, uh, she was a young um, EMT, uh, worked in the ambulance. And uh, there was an incident where police uh, forced forced them, forced entry into her home. Her uh, significant other opened fire, and in the hail of gunshots, uh, Miss Taylor was uh, murdered. Um, the public in Louisville, as well as the world, have a lot of issues with this murder. And let me break those down to you. The reason that they uh, entered the house is because there was a search warrant. Apparently, her ex boyfriend was involved with some illicit activity. However, they had been broke up months ago and he was in jail currently at the time of arrest. Um, supposedly a package was delivered to her home and they thought it was due to him. So they executed a warrant. Um, the officers before they entered this take out, they had officers and detectives. They told the ambulance to leave, which is not standard for any police raid, uh, no medical attention was received or given to Miss Taylor till 20 minutes after the shooting occurred. Uh, the warrant that the police had from the judge was a, a knock and announce warrant before entering. The officers did not knock before they entered. Uh, one clue that uh, substantiates that claim is uh, Miss Taylor's boyfriend was arrested for attempted murder and the charges were dropped. Um, because the police didn't identify themselves before entry. <clears throat> There's also a 911 call on record saying that uh, someone is breaking to my home made for Miss Taylor's residence. And there were multiple errors on the police report. The initial police report stated that Taylor had no injuries. Uh, again, the warrant was executed late at night uh, and all the body cams were turned off. Um, due to this unfortunate uh, incident or continued pattern of events recently, the mayor of Louisville has banned the no knock, no notification warrant policy throughout the county. Urban League president Sadika Reynolds said there will be no celebration in regards to the Kentucky Derby. There should be no business as usual while we are in pain. Our sister is dead. Um, Spurring off of these comments, protesters gathered at South Central Park to have sort of a spiritual revival before they marched down to legendary Churchill Downs with the uh, chant, no derby, no peace. Now let's talk about the Kentucky Derby. Why was that so significant? Uh, most people think it's just a horse race, but it really galvanizes the racing community in the city of Louisville as well as its residents. It's the first of the three races that make up the Triple Crown, with the latter being the Preakness and Belmont Stakes. And uh, it's designed only for three-year-old horses. Uh, sometimes foals do run, uh, but mostly it's three-year-old male horses. Um, in 1872, uh, Meriwether Lewis Clark, he's the, uh, I know that name sounds familiar, but his grandfather, William Clark, led the famous Lewis and Clark expedition, which started uh, from the Three Rivers and uh, Pittsburgh to examine the Midwest. Um, his grandson traveled to England and they just wanted to visit for leisure and went and saw some uh, horse stables. Um, then they went on to Paris, France, where they met a group of horse racing enthusiasts at the French Jockey Club in 1863. Um, they had organized the Grand Prix of Paris, which was a premier racing event in the 1800s. And at that time, it was the greatest race in France. 
when they returned home to Kentucky, uh, Clark organized the Louisville Jockey Club in 1863, and they raised money to build quality racing facilities in Louisville. Um, that racing facility became known as Churchill Downs, named after John and Henry Churchill, who provided the land for the racetrack. It got that name officially in 1937. So let's backtrack for a second. We know that in 1863, this is two years before the end of the Civil War. So again, uh, Mr. Clark and all his representatives that traveled to Europe and, and were interested in racing would have all their um, enslaved Africans uh, do all this work. Um, we'll touch on that a little bit later, but I just wanted to let you know about 1863. OK. Um, now, in regards to the Kentucky Derby, another quick fact. A lot of times people know about the mint julep, the, uh, the, the hot brown, the open face sandwich. But a lot of people always ask, why do people wear those big floppy hats? Well, the hats come from a European tradition. Remember, uh, Clark went to Europe and examined their racing clubs before starting uh, the Louisville Jockey Club. And these hats in Europe were tradition of women to wear sporting events. Remember, this was the Victorian era and uh, the hats were designed to keep the sun off of them, keep them pristine in their so-called uh, pure Europeanness at this time. So that came to America and became, again, a, a fashion staple, but it does stem from a, a bit of aristocracy and saying that, you know, I'm better than you because, again, in Europe, uh, the wear a hat signified uh, nobility, class, wealth, and status, uh, hegemony within your uh, state. And they took these same uh, customs to America. Um, again, Clark and his representatives, uh, all their horses were maintained by individuals of African descent, but a lot of us don't see that because now currently we're not in the sport. Um, in regards to the recent uh, events and this year's Kentucky Derby it was very historic, not only due to it being ran with the protests going on, but because this was the first time in over, I think, uh, 20 years that someone in the race was of African descent. Um, in 2000, there was a rider but this year it's an owner. So uh, Greg Harbutt, he's an owner. He's 35 years old. He owned Necker Island. Um, before the uh, before the race, Necker Island had finished third in its uh, last previous races. In the Derby, it did finish, uh, but it uh, did not uh, place in the top three, finished in ninth place. Um, protesters, with him being of uh, African descent, asked him to pull uh, Necker Island out of race and protests uh, for Breonna Taylor. Uh, Mr. Harbert explained that he stands with Black Lives Matter, he stands with the movement, and he stands with justice for Breonna Taylor. He also stated that as an African-American man involved in an industry that's not inclusive to people that look like uh, me, there's no way he could sit out one of the largest race days in the United States and not bring awareness to the African-American contributions, contributions giving to horse racing. A side note, a lot of these contributions were made by his family, his uh, grandfather and great grandfather. In 19, from 1930 to 1946, the legendary uh, horse uh, man of war was cared for by Will Harbert, um, Greg's great grandfather. And they became so intertwined that when he died in 1947, his obituary was listed uh, along with the uh, horses and the people that work with them. Again, this is very significant because this is still 1947. The Civil Rights has it, Act has not passed and we're in the South. So you're getting uh, recognition where normally it didn't come to a person of African descent. The horsemanship that he got from his great grandfather uh, was passed down to his uh, son, Tom, who um, worked at uh, Spendthrift Farms. It was a stallion barn that operated in the 1950s. So a stallion barn is uh, where they take, uh, you know, top thoroughbreds and breed them. Um, once you win a race or win multiple races, uh, 
your proverbial stock increases. So there's a huge industry, not only in racing, but in breeding. So um, he worked at a stallion farm. All right. The, the family was sending his first Kentucky Derby starter out when Tom was the part owner. They had a colt named Touch Bar. He, in his first uh, Derby race, he finished 11th. Um, that piece of family pride is very near and dear to them. And again, this symbols that their family's longstanding tradition in horse racing in America, overcoming all types of adversity uh, from the early 1900s. The sad part about this was due to it being in 1947 and grandfather's Tom's name did not appear in the race program and he could not attend the race because blocks weren't allowed into Churchill Downs in the 1940s. Now let's look at how horse racing began in America. So horses are not indigenous to America. Horses are indigenous to uh, North Africa in particular, the Arabian Peninsula, and they ended up in North America due to Spanish conquistadors. Um, again, through the uh, authority of the Catholic Church in the 1400s, uh, Spain was given uh, anonymous uh, autonomous control over um, the Western Hemisphere and colonized North America, South America, as well as the, uh, a lot of the Caribbean islands. Um, in this process, um, not only did horses, but people uh, ran away as well. And these runaway uh, horses became the wild horses that were known in the Great Plains in the Midwest. And the first, first horse races in America began in the late 1600s. So again, let's look at the time period. In the 1600s, obviously, uh, we're still entrenched in the uh, transatlantic slave trade. Um, politics is bad for individuals of African descent. In fact, there is no politics. Um, the treatment, um, we all should know about that by now. And what these uh, plantation owners in the South decided to do was um, they had boxing, uh, mandingo fighting for entertainment. Then they start racing horses. So the people that cared for the horses and fed them and shooed them uh, and sometimes even trained them if they got a wild horse, uh, end up riding them. Um, it was very common for individuals of African American, excuse me, of African descent to do this because, again, in the 1600s, um, due to the system of chattel slavery in the United States, um, that was that was very prevalent. It was the uh, the name of the day in the Deep South. So, but more than 200 years before Jackie Robinson took the baseball field. Uh, black jockeys, they were the first uh, professional athletes in the United States. And horse racing was America's first prime time, uh, fair, pastime, excuse me. Um, slaves and later free black men ruled this sport of kings, again, because you no, know, you had to be rich to have a horse uh, throughout history. Um, the riders were off, oftentimes former slaves, and they were very small in stature and oftentimes very young merely boys because, you know, on a racehorse, you want to move as fast as possible. So you want your rider to be as light as possible. Um, most times these riders are in between 13 and 15 years old. Um, again, the norm at this time was that people of African descent were not smart. Uh, they didn't lack capacity to educate themselves. A lot of misconceptions that were put forward, but yet you have children taming uh, thoroughbreds. And if you know anything about horses, thoroughbreds are two times the size of regular horses. They're designed just for speed. So their upper torso is very muscular or their legs are very thin. That's why a lot of horses don't finish races because they're so top heavy when they're sprinting. Oftentimes they break a bone or joint. Um, in horse racing, two things happen. If you're a well-known horse, you can get studded out but if not, um, oftentimes euthanasia um, is the consequence for that. Um, not only were uh, Africans uh, the, or individuals of African descent in the United States the first uh, uh, jockeys, they were also the first cowboys too, 
quick history note is the term cowboy uh, is a racial term that was used in the South. Everywhere else, and particularly in Spain, use the term ranchero. Cowboy was used because, again, you couldn't call a man of African descent a man, so you, you called him a boy. Um, the first known jockey of African descent uh, to take uh, the sport by storm was named by Monkey Simon. Again, he was given uh, uh, the grading first name due to the times and the era that he was in. Um, he used to ride a horse named Hania Maria, and oftentimes he would race against uh, rich individuals that own horses. And one of these individuals was President Andrew Jackson. So he raced Andrew Jackson's horses head to head nine times. And he never lost between 1811 and 1815. There's a famous quote uh, that Andrew Jackson made that said, uh, beating the horse for Maria was the only thing that he comp he failed to accomplish in his life. Uh, fast forwarding to the uh, 1860s, uh, horse racing took uh, a slow nosedive due to the onslaught of the Civil War. All available horses were used for cavalry regiments. But in 1865, when Reconstruction was starting to happen, horse racing again became popular. And this was the year that the first Kentucky Derby was run. Um, again, in 1875, the first Kentucky Derby was run. And the first winner of that race was an African-American jockey named Oliver Lewis. His trainer was also African-American. Um, there were some great uh, other jockeys in that time, Alonzo Clayton, he won the Kentucky Derby at uh, age 15 in 1892. Uh, fun fact about him, Chicago is he started racing in Chicago at Washington Park Racetrack. There was another famous jockey named Jimmy Winkfield. He was the first jockey to win the Kentucky Derby three times. And he won it uh, three times in a row from 1901 to 1903. Uh, he became an expat and in 1904 moved to Europe to start racing due to the uh, uh, racial conditions of this country. Again, um, he was a professional athlete uh, making, if he made at that time, $10,000 a year. Um, that's far, uh, uh, that amount of money in 1900 or, or it was just a lot, let's just say that. Um, the first back-to-back -back Kentucky Derby winner was another African-American named Isaac Murphy, who completed the feat between 1890 and 1891. He was also the second jockey to achieve the feat Jimmy Wakefield did. Um, in the first 28 runnings of the Derby, African-Americans won 15 of those races. So let's take let's take that into context. In the first 28 races, African Americans won 15 percent. Excuse me, 15. So if it was 30 and they won 15, that would be 50 percent. So these are great odds. And the reason it's so great is because these jockeys had to face some tremendous pressure. Um, oftentimes. Uh, these young men got into racing as, as children uh, for various reasons, because this was seen just like basketball is today or football or baseball as a means out. Um, so if you are 13 in 1901, um, there was a hundred percent chance that your parents were former uh, or formerly enslaved individuals. So these people, these young men, uh, or the first in her family to uh, oftentimes have a paying job. They would take care of their families. Um, but with that came a lot of hatred. Uh, they had to stay in certain enclaves to stop or prevent being strange fruit. Uh, again, once you have money and you can buy certain things, it was, it was seen as flaunting or arrogant, um, and particularly in the Southern states for a Negro or a colored man or any other colorful adjective you can use to wear nice clothing and show up um, as they would say, quote unquote, uh, the white man in his own country, in his own city, etc. So oftentimes these jockeys 
uh, being 13, 14, 15 years of age, having 10, 000, making $10,000 a year in 1900. Um, they had to protect themselves. So uh, they kind of lived uh, sheltered lives. Um, let's take a break for a quick second, and then we'll go into the GOAT of jockeys, Isaac Murphy, um, the best jockey of all time, is said. And then we'll talk a little bit more about uh, the African-American presence of horse racing, Sports Zone Chicago. We'll see you in a second. Compassion, noun, sympathetic pity and concern for the sufferings or misfortunes of others. We're all born with it, it's in us. Don't believe me? When you hear a baby cry, something pulls at you. You want to ease that pain. You want to soothe that hurt. No one had to teach you that. It's called compassion, and it's in you. However, at some point you turned it off when it came to me. 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 The cries of my soul have gone unheard, but today you will hear me. My heart has wailed a melody loud enough to shatter your ears and you ignored me. But this week, you will hear me. This body has beat the drums of anguish, only to be silenced. But this month, you will hear me. This year, this decade, this century, I will be heard, and you, and you will be the one to hear me. And when I am finally heard, Show compassion. Show compassion. Show compassion. Remember, it's in you. Welcome back to Sports 101 on Sports Zone Chicago, Chicago's number one sports talk app. Please download Sports Zone Chicago and check out the array of shows they have. From Mr. Smoke Fellin, the Humidor Podcast, What's Up Cuz, Sean and Maya in the Morning, 
and a variety of other shows. Again, Sports Zone Chicago, Chicago's number one sports talk app. Back to our show. Before we left, we were talking about Isaac Murphy, the goat of horse racing. So let's find out who he is. Isaac Murphy was born to a enslaved African woman named America on January 1st, 1861 in Kentucky. So Isaac was born four years before the Civil War uh, ended. At, as Isaac began his racing career, it was very tumultuous in the South. So oftentimes what would happen is, again, these are very small children, um, the jockeys. So in regards to working, um, it was based off your color. Um, the lighter you were, the closer you worked to the house. The darker you were, the further you away from the house. So if he couldn't do laborious work or as he was getting older, he couldn't play with uh, his uh, captor's children. Um, the parents would send the children off uh, so they could uh, either make some money or they won't get any harm. So oftentimes uh, the kids would get sent off or even run off to uh, stables and start uh, working for uh, jockeys or trainers. And uh, one of the first things they would have to do was muck stalls. Um, mucking a stall is uh, cleaning out the uh, excrement um, of the horse on a daily basis, which, you know, is a very uh, daunting task in my mind. Uh, but then they would go from mucking stalls to shoeing to grooming um, to basic uh, riding or sprint riding or training to moving up to be the rider of the horse. So um, Isaac Murphy did all this. And uh, at the genesis of, of this around 1870 and 1890, the South was in turmoil. Um, there was a transition. Uh, this was the reconstruction period. Again, the war ended 1865. And after that, uh, that began to reconstruct, meaning um, the states that rebelled, they had to follow uh, strict laws to get admitted back into the Union. Um, they also enacted Jim Crow laws. Um, to hinder uh, individuals of African descent. Uh, one of these laws was a uh, vagrancy. So um, if you were caught, uh, you know, walking around and didn't have a place to live or walking by yourself, you were considered a vagrant and you would be sent to prison. So again, uh, this was just an attempt to increase their free labor force. Um, after the Civil War, obviously their free labor force ended. So they tried to recreate it through laws. If you um, even look at the uh, Constitution, um, it, it clearly states, or the Constitution, Bill of Rights, uh, first part of the Constitution, a lot of our documents state that slavery is illegal um, until a crime is committed. So uh, if I'm a young child and I can't stay where I was living and I run off, uh, I might want to muck this stall real good because I may have to sleep there or sleep outside of it on some straw, um, so I, I won't go to jail. So all this was going on when Isaac Murphy was growing up again. He was born in 1861. Um, his first victory came in 1875 at the Lexington Crab Orchard. Um, he had notable wins at the Mom of Handicap in New Jersey. That was one of his best races ever. Um, it was sad because they reported that he was racing drunk. And obviously they tested him, but they kind of found out he was poisoned. So someone tried to kill him. Um, Murphy, again, he was a superstar at this time um, in the early uh, or excuse me, in the late 1800s. He was earning around twenty five thousand dollars a year. He had his own. Uh, they called him tobacco cards at the time, but it was a baseball training card. Um, he had sponsorship deals with, uh, you know, shaving creams and other people that I sponsored through the uh, different mail order catalogs at the time. Remember, this is the 1800s. So people were getting Sears Roebuck books in the mail. Um, when Murphy finished racing, uh, he accumulated the best winning percentage ever at 44, 44%. And that is still unprecedented to this day. Um, Murphy was also known as a social celebrity. Um, 
he well before we get to that he is estimated to win 539 of 1550 1538 races and he averaged uh 15,000 a year toward the beginning but at his peak it was 25,000 a year um he was the highest paid horse racer in the United States um this was uh amazing even bigger than uh Jackie Robinson uh, breaking the color in Major League Baseball because of the timing of it. Um, this is the 1800s. Um, he's a man of African descent, and he's a smaller man. Um, and also the Jim Crow laws at the time. The National Museum of Racing's Hall of Fame inducted him with his highest honor in 1956, um, memorializing his feats for all to remember. Um, Again, going back to uh, Isaac, not only was he a great racer, but um, he was a businessman. Again, he had endorsements. He ended up owning a horse that won the Kentucky Derby, and he was most known for his uh, his style. Um, Isaac was known, again, to make $25,000 a year in the 1800s. It's pretty astonishing. So he was known for his uh, flamboyance. Um, he was a, a womanizer. And uh, he liked to wear, you know, the finest thing. So in the 1800s, uh, the thing was to get clothes shipped from Europe. So Isaac would wear silk shirts and pants. And not only would he wear them, he would uh, change almost every hour. So he would take a bath. Uh, and there was no showers at the time. He would take a bath and uh, change clothes and put on uh, his uh, scent about every hour, entertain. Um, talk about the whole nine yards in the 1800s. This is a, a, a black man standing around 5'5", five, five, um, that's dressed up uh, sort of like uh, like the lawn jockeys are today that you see on people's yards. Uh, nice coat, fancy coattail, and, um, you know, in a rich house, grand piano in the living room in the 1800s, and then he has a party and he stops midway through and comes back and changes into another outfit. He was, uh, if there's a term for a male diva, uh, he's one of them. Um, sadly to say that there was a decline in uh, horse racing. Um, again, uh, and all this stuff is not to pick on Chicago, but Chicago was a, a urban uh, Mecca in the 1900s, meaning a lot of people moved there, not only from the South, but from Europe to get work in factories. So it was a lot of uh, biased opinions coming from there. The reason I say that is on most um, of my shows, there's always a segment where there's someone from Chicago saying something, you know, ignorant or out of place. And I just want to give you some context on why that is. So in the 1900s, there was a famous Chicago sports writer that said that when he went to the track and saw black fans cheering for black writers, he was uncomfortable. And that reminded him that black men can vote. Um, I don't. If you ever been to the South, um, um, they sing a song. Uh, the two songs they sing the most: "Sweet Home Alabama" for nostalgia, and "Dixie." Um, so "Dixie Land" obviously is everything under the Mason Dixie Line, and uh, "Dixie Land" was the the home of slavery. So um, after slavery. Obviously, there was a lot of groups that wanted to resurrect the so-called glory of the South. Uh, some groups wore sheets to resemble ghosts of the Confederate soldiers, uh, referencing both uh, sects of the Ku Klux Klan that developed. Uh, some groups uh, did it uh, through politics, enacting uh, Jim Crow laws uh, and segregation. Uh, throughout their municipalities that they lived in. Uh, some others did it through violence uh, in regards to the songs where, or the, the mass lynchings that went on in the South at this time. Um, there was also the same behavior in the North, but it was more prevalent in the South. So when a sports writer grumbles and says that uh, it upsets him to see black people cheering for other black people in a sporting event, it reminds him that black men can vote or have power. Um, that kind of shows the attitudes then and now, because the same things happen 
Um, you can go to a Blackhawks game or um, any sporting event and, you know, cheer for, you know, a lone black player and you'll get some sentiment. In baseball, um, it happens all the time. Soccer, um, you know, football. So, I mean, this is still going on to this day. So, obviously, that sentiment has not changed. So, from the beginning of horse racing in the uh, 1400s all the way up to the 1900s, uh, it was ran by individuals of African descent. But in the 1900s, as money started to increase, uh, publication started to increase, sponsorship, and then visibility uh, remember, closed circuit television start to come into play. So these racetracks will use that. Um, that also began a lot of gambling gambling establishments as you would get closed circuit replays and people would bet on them. So as all this happened, uh, people started to act on this uh, sentiment that the sports writer had in Chicago and ban them from the sport. Uh, so there was fewer and fewer chances to become jockeys, trainers, and the only job that left that was left and relegated to individuals of African descent was uh, mucking and uh, basic uh, care. Um, oftentimes, there was a lot of individuals that did this that were jockeys, which was the prime position outside of owner and, and trainer. You know, those were the top three positions. So just imagine you're a jockey winning races in the late 1800s. Now it's the 1900s. You go from riding a horse to cleaning up excrement. So that can take a toll on you mentally, along with the fact that what's going on in present society. Um, the white jockeys, they started to demand segregated competitions. Again, they were losing. Uh, one part I think in regards to losing is if uh, you put your mindset as this is my only way. Oftentimes you do better. If uh, I'm around these animals 24 seven and I care for them and I raised them growing up in my mind, they will perform better on you. Oftentimes the, uh, the black jockeys didn't have to resort to beating their horses. Uh, they were known to whisper in their horse's ear to get them to run faster. Where now on TV, you'll see, um, especially down the home stretch, where that's it's only allowed, uh, I believe, or that's where it's most frequently occurs that the jockeys will start uh, whipping their horses to beat them faster. Again, due to the nature of thoroughbreds with their heavy uh, upper bodies, this leads to broken legs. And if you're if not a famous horse, you become euthanized. So literally these jockeys will beat these horses to death. Whereas the, uh, the black jockeys had a, sort of a je ne sais quoi or horse whisperers per se, they can lean over and talk to their horses and they would perform for them. So the um, the white jockeys began to ask for segregated competitions, uh, not only in the South, but in the, uh, in New York as well. Um, New York is a large heartbed, hotbed, excuse me, of racing in particular upstate New York. Uh, one of these white jockeys told the New York Sun in 1908, that one of his black opponents was the best jockey he had ever seen, but that he and his colleagues did not like to have a Negro ride in the same races with them. Remember in 1908, uh, a lot of the uh, America is still at turmoil. It's around 40 or 50 years after the Civil War. Uh, Jim Crow is in full effect. And the sea, um, the person that you're supposedly uh, is uh, inferior to you do this uh, made these jockeys upset. Why did it make them upset? Because it takes a lot of craft to be a jockey. Again, these thoroughbreds are huge horses and all these jockeys are miniature in stature. So not only do they have to have some sort of strength and particularly in the lower body to uh, hang on to these horses, but to guide them with their knees uh, uh, sort of like how the indigenous uh, cultures of America and particularly the Great Plains did where they rode bareback and they would guide the horse with their knees, hold on to his neck and mane, talk to the horse, try to become one with the horse. Uh, these black jockeys mastered that. Um, they could turn the horses 
uh, with their knees or bodies by putting pressure on their shoulder blades at certain points. Um, they got better production out the horses and they did not need to whip them. So a lot of jockeys were envious of this, especially in a time where it's 1908. This, these people can't vote. Uh, they can't do a lot of things that are second class citizens, but yet they show you up in what's supposed to be the most gentleman sport, the king sport, because again, rich people were the only people that own horses. In a 1905 Washington Post article titled Negro Rider on Wayne, the writer insisted that black men were inferior and thus destined to disappear from the track, as Native Americans had inevitably disappeared from their homelands. What is this writer conveying right here? All he's saying is, is that even though these black men are master and these horses uh, learn how to train them at rapid rates. Remember the early, the first Kentucky Derby winner was a black man. The first three time winner was a black man. The first trainer was a black man. The youngest uh, winner at 15 years old was a black man. So to control, control a three year old thoroughbred stallion is pretty impressive for, you know, a teenager. But yet this rider is insisting that these people are inferior. Why? Because it is uh, looked at or was looked at at the time that uh, if you have uh, ape-like mannerisms or you're so athletic because you're a part animal, it is you're supposed to be able to communicate with the animals and have them work for you and have them do better. So that wasn't a sign of of knowledge or ingenuity or training techniques. It was it was just looked at as, okay, well, they're animals too. So again, that shows the inferiority, not of the people they were talking about, but the inferiority of the people that were making those claims. Because again, these were oftentimes children uh, on these horses where the, uh, the white riders were grown men. Using the Native Americans had inevitably disappeared from their homeland was was uh, pivotal is stating that through uh, belief, uh, which is uh, enacting power through belief, excuse me, which is the definition of racism or one of the definitions is established. So oftentimes today, especially with the Black Lives Matter and these other protests going on, you hear individuals say, well, if it's a Black Lives Matter, you know, that's that's racial, that's segregating. But it's not because the individuals with Black Lives Matter do not have the power to enforce that throughout and ban anyone from anything, which is one of the main tenets of racism. Um, again, these riders that got banned, um, oftentimes they went from jockeys to muckers or just out of the sport altogether. Uh, some of them became winos. Um, oftentimes their obituaries are very sad. Um, Suit Perkins, he won the Kentucky Derby at 15. He uh, ended up drinking himself to death at 31 years old. There was another rider named Tom Britton who couldn't find a job and committed suicide by swallowing acid. Remember, a lot of these jockeys started in this as youths because they would become professional riders at 14, 15, 16 years of age. So if they did this their whole uh, lives up to around 21 or 22, and then uh, through racial uh, segregation, they're pulled away from the sport, their means of income, they weren't allowed to educate themselves. Um, it was very hard for them to find employment. And then the social status, they went from having money, being looked at uh, in the community as a leader, someone to look up to, to Nile all of a sudden uh, being homeless, depression kicks in, and oftentimes they would commit suicide. Um, there was another jockey named Albert Issam. He bought a pistol at a pawn shop and shot himself in the head in front of the clerk. So that is a clear example of uh, someone just going to their wits end. You go to an actual uh, pawn shop, purchase a weapon, 
as soon as she gives it to you at the counter, you put a bullet in it and kill yourself right in the store. The decline of African Americans in racing continued up until um, 2000 when there was one rider of uh, African descent until uh, this past Saturday's Kentucky Derby. Again, and looking at all this information that was presented to us today, how can we use it to move forward? I hope everyone gained from this episode that number one, we learned something about horse racing. We learned about the origins of horse racing and who was behind it. Having this knowledge, we should not keep it, but share it so that way some other ch young children or adults can pick it up and maybe guide some others to this sport. Uh, Maya and myself were talking uh, last week about doing some things, um, interacting youth in Chicago and Pittsburgh and Little League Baseball. So as my goal in doing this, along with the Sports Zone Chicago family, that you take all of our shows and get something out of it and take it back to your community. So if you're in the racing or you live in Upper Barbell, Maryland, or Charles County, Maryland, and you have horses, or North Carolina, Georgia, uh, Texas, uh, where the rodeo was prevalent, you know, get the word out that, you know, we can be horse jockeys as well. Again, I'm Jamar Hart from Sports Talk 101. I thank you for tuning in. Please join me next week when we look at the um, HBCU influence on uh, BCS football, starting with Florida A&M University in the 1970s. Please tune in to Sports Zone Chicago, Chicago's number one sports uh, talk app, and all its shows. Thank you so much, and I look forward to seeing you next week.